Hi, I'm Fiji Simo, and I lead video and gaming products for Facebook. I'm excited to host another episode in our Game Changers video series. Today, I'm in EA's headquarters in California to talk to Laura Mieli, EA's Chief Studio Officer and longtime gaming industry veteran. With new audiences, technologies, and social trends making video games more mainstream, I'll talk to Laura on what it means to create games for everyone. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Fiji. Welcome to EA. Thanks for visiting us today. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> so, Laura, you've had an amazing career uh, in the gaming industry with leadership roles spanning marketing, development, and analytics. And most recently, you transitioned from your role as VP of Global Publishing to head up EA's World War Studios as Chief Studio Officer. Can you take us back to where it all started and what made you consider a career in gaming? Yes, sure. Well, first, I um, I went to school for architecture and design, actually, and was working in architectural firms for about seven years. And a friend of mine told me about a game studio that was hiring for a project management role. And, um, and I didn't take it too seriously, but I thought, well, I'll go talk to them and see what they have to say. <laughs> and um, it was uh, Westwood Studios in Las Vegas. And um, they had set up a demo for me during the interview. And they were one of the first companies to create uh, matchmaking um, and online gaming. So they created a version of Monopoly for Hasbro. And I played a game in English from the US against someone in Germany and they played in German and it blew my mind. And so I left the <laughs> conference room begging them to hire me because I just felt like this was the future. This was the future. This was um, having socially connected experiences and making the world a smaller place and people being connected through play was incredibly inspiring. And so, um, and then I, um, very shortly after I started at West, we launched Command and Conquer, um, which was a big success. And I, th I thought that's just how it worked in games. You work hard <laughs> on a game and you launch it and everyone loves you and everyone loves the games. Um, though, of course, over my 22 years, I have found that wasn't always the case, but it was, I was very lucky to start that way. And I feel quite fortunate that I started in a studio environment and that I worked for um, developers and I learned a tremendous amount about the art of development. And I have a huge respect for developers to this day because of that start. Um, I also worked with um, a developer, a producer, um, who was uh, the senior producer on Blade Runner, and he was very difficult, and um, I fought with him quite a bit. I was the head of marketing at the time, and so um, I married him. And so I met my husband. You didn't think it was going to go like that. <laughs> yeah, so, I, so I met my husband um, in gaming. And so um, it's just been um, a very lucky turn on many friends for me um, being in gaming. <laughs> so Ian now has over 300 million registered players around the world with a brand portfolio that includes The Sims, Madden NFL, and EA Sports FIFA. Can you share some insights into the people who are playing your games today? Well, gosh, with 350 million people playing um, in games such as FIFA that come out every year um, with you know tens of millions of players, um, our player base is quite vast and expansive. And so um, we genuinely have the world represented in the games that we play. And we have to um, consider that and think um, about that as we develop and design and think about our communities and think about how we socially engineer experiences in our games and how we design and develop um, characters. So um, we we are genuinely here to inspire the world to play. And when we say the world, we mean the world. It is um, quite an expansive global player base. So what are some principles that guide you in making games for these diverse audiences? Well, I, I would I love for our, um, our games to represent our player base. Mm -hmm. And so we are um, very thoughtful um, about um, inclusion and diversity and our characters and um, how we think about game modes. And in turn, we're also very thoughtful and focused on having a representative employee base at EA that represents our player base. And so it's all very connected, um, I feel. And so it's something that yeah. we have concerted strategies and efforts um, on multiple fronts to ensure that we represent our players and that we bring the most diverse experiences to the world. So how do you go about building strong female characters that would really resonate with women? Um, about four years ago, we um, created our Women's Ultimate Team. It's an employee resource group for the company. Um, and though we've always have had a pretty strong representation of females in our games, such as our Bioware games and strong female protagonists in our Star Wars games, and of course we have The Sims, um, but we wanted to be more deliberate and intentional about how we thought about diversity in our games, again, to represent that global player base that we have. And so we created a diversity framework. And the diversity framework is essentially a filter or an audit of how many lines women have in our games and how much women are played in our games and how much they are represented in our games. 
And um, I, I really feel quite passionately and believe in the um, quality of the teams that we have here and believe in their um, ability to make really great choices. And so our framework is not a prescription. It is um, simply a lens and filter and a framework that we utilize in different phases of our development process. So we have what we call gates. And as we look at gate zero and gate one as we're creating games, the teams use the diversity filter. And um, and again, there's no prescription that they have to have a certain percentage of women in any, um, you know, in any part of our games, but it is a, um, is it a filter? So they're intentional about the diversity and inclusion that they think about as they're considering all of the characters as they're considering the athletes as they're considering the worlds that they're creating and it's been incredibly productive and since then we have um, introduced the nba women's league in our nba game then the women's national league in our fifa game we have female um, athletes in ufc um, so it's been um, it's been a really great uh, move for us and that we are just expanding the options and opportunities for not just women to play our games, but for women to be represented in the experiences that we create. So talking about representation, how do you actually go about representing these female characters in the mix of strengths and femininity? Yes, that's a great question. And we learned quite a bit through the development process. So um, of course, we have a tremendous amount of animations and rigs and character um, builds you know, in, from our games, and particularly when we embarked on our sports games. Um, we used what we had and it clearly became evident that it didn't represent the physics and movements and animations <laughs> of women. So, um, so the teams um, dug really deep and worked very hard in developing all new rigs and animations yeah. and physics. And so um, the balance of, like in the case of our UFC game, the balance of femininity and strength and power, um, but still clearly being the movement um, and feel of a woman um, was, was very clear. So tell me about a time when your company ethos of creating games for everyone was really tested. It's like, for example, we saw a lot of reactions from the community to the Battlefield uh, 5 trailer that featured a, a female playable character for the first time. Yes. Yes, we, we continue to get um, a lot of feedback about that. Um, and we stand incredibly strong and actually feel even more conviction about our position on this. We um, implemented it in a couple of ways in Battlefield V. Um, the female character that was seen in our announced trailer is actually um, an area where we wanted to provide more customization and creative expression for our players. And so we, of course, offer the ability to play as a female character, offer the ability to customize that character, and that was a form of creative self-expression for the game. We also, another dimension of Battlefield V, which is set in World War II, is um, we wanted to explore the untold stories of World War II. We didn't want to start or just go with the expected invasion of Normandy. Um, we wanted to have untold stories, and many of the untold stories of World War II are about women. Women played a very large role in World War II. And so some of the stories and single player modes in Battlefield V, um, you play as female characters as well. Um, and we, again, we, we didn't set out to necessarily make a big statement about that, but we just did what we naturally do as we think about player base, we think about a setting and we think about customization and creative self-expression. And, um, and we just received a lot of feedback. And so um, we created um, a movement called um, it's hashtag everyone's battlefield um, because we believe in um, creating games for everyone. And so we're using this as an opportunity to um, continue to fortify our position and message and statement and that we will stand strong in this position. At Facebook, we actually put people in community at the heart of our gaming mission. And a big part of my role involves working on initiatives to build a global community and create like spaces for everyone to enjoy games together and feel safe. So in your role as chief studio officer, what are the ways in which you look to engage with that gaming community? Well, we certainly um, create and socially curate opportunities for people to have shared experiences in our games. And that's where I think it starts. And um, it's, it's what I mentioned earlier, what got me into gaming to begin with. The idea that you can have the shared experience together through play is incredibly powerful. Um, there are many opportunities and um, a big evolution for us to continue to move that forward um, in ways that we are starting to in our games today, but I am incredibly optimistic about the runway that we have um, to bring people together um, and in ways, whether it be through competition, whether it be through playing together, 
whether it be through watching together. Um, so the idea about play, create and watch in our games and doing that socially, I think is incredibly powerful. So we um, are going to greatly prioritize um, what it means to have social experiences in our games as we move forward. It's um, definitely a new era and the studios for EA um, in that on that front. So you've talked a little bit about the EA's Women Ultimate Team. Uh, can you tell me more about like what you're doing as the executive sponsor of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we I started about four years ago, and um, it started simply as a way for women to connect within EA. So I spend a lot of time traveling and spend a lot of time talking to women and. Um, the subject of diversity and inclusion is so vast and you could take on so many different projects. And I, I was concerned that we'd find ourselves a year or two later and we hadn't really accomplished or moved too many things down, you know, the, the field. So I wanted to be very, very focused and very deliberate about what we were going to accomplish in the first phase of this. And so um, we simply set up the and created the organization to create a sense of community for women. I heard from women around the company that they were lonely and that they didn't feel as connected. And particularly, we have we have offices all over the world, and we have offices that maybe will only have 30 people in some cases. And so, you know, there there's a smaller percentage of and population of women in those locations. And so, my motivation was to create a sense of belonging and create a sense of community and a, a sense of connection for women um, with each other. And um, I was an incredibly vocal advocate for the women in, um, in our company to advocate for each other, to support each other, to champion each other's successes, to support each other in meetings, to celebrate, you know, promotions and um, and highlight um, when people had a big win or a big accomplishment in their in their um, work life. So um, I, it really helped us change and evolve the culture. And these things take time, and they start small. They start with, let's meet every second Thursday of the month and have lunch together, to um, let's go volunteer in the community, to let's create a diversity framework for our games. <laughs> and so um, so it has evolved. And um, I'm incredibly proud of the work. And, it, and it, it had to start in a very focused, deliberate way. And it's just growing in this beautiful um, result of amazing programs. And um, people are, when the women, women are very highly motivated. And I'm so pleased to say that we have many men that are involved in supporting um, the efforts and championing the progression of women in the company as well. That's been just a, a, a beautiful outcome of, of the program. Yeah, and we know that's critical. You've mentioned advocacy. Uh, who has been doing that for you? Who has been your role model, your mentor? Well, I, I've had I've had many. I'm lucky to work with such great people at EA. Um, a few highlights for me: um, we had a woman on our board, Geraldine Layborn, and um, she was um, an incredible advocate for women in TV broadcasting. Um, so she created Nickelodeon for Viacom and the Oxygen Network for Oprah, and she created a, a network. I think it was the earliest um, development of a lean-in circle. Actually, back in those <laughs> days, it was um, you know it was like 30 years ago, I think, or so. And um, and they would meet for drinks every Thursday night. And they would support each other, advocate for each other. If someone was at risk of losing their job, they would help them or they would hire them. And they um, championed, again, championed ideas and, um, and meetings and lifted women up. And to this day, there's a significant body of female executives in TV and the TV um, world in New York. And, I, and it came from this group. So I knew the power of that. And she was one of the first people at EA to really have that conversation and kind of and, and, and have that breakthrough um, for our culture and our organization. She felt very you know, bold and bold and encouraged um, and, and courageous to stand up in front of our male executives to say, this counts, this matters, this is important, and here's why it's important. Um, and then I also worked for um, the one that probably had the most significant impact was a woman named Nancy Smith, and she ran her publishing team here at EA. And, um, and she was always a very strong, but yet very gracious and, um, uh, and, and compassionate advocate for me. I remember being in a meeting once and um, someone that worked for her kept interrupting me and she stopped him, stopped the meeting and let me finish my sentence. And I just, it blew me away. I just couldn't believe that she would do that. And again, she just did it in such a polite, gracious way, but she made it very clear that um, all voices are heard. And she always had just a special... Um, you know, she 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 especially watched out for for women in, in our careers, and so um, that was I was I'm super grateful for that, That's and awesome. I want to do the same thing for women here. Seems like you're on your way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What are your aspirations for 2019, and and what can we we expect to see from you as you settle into this new role? 
I'm fairly new in the role, and um, I spent my first hundred days going and visiting all of our studios, and it was a how real, many is that? About 20. Wow. Uh, yeah, across all, the globe. All, yeah, across the globe. And um, it was really important because I've been here for such a long time. I didn't want to walk in with preconceived ideas or opinions. And I have very strong opinions, but I wanted to um, have a clean slate um, as I was taking on this new responsibility. And I also didn't want it to be led through our product or through the work. I really wanted to connect with our people. And so I set out to visit all of our studios. Um, I didn't allow any PowerPoints <laughs> and I didn't allow anyone to show me product. And so I wanted to sit with the teams. I had one-on-ones, I had team meetings and I would have town halls and all the studios because I wanted to hear what um, was going on with the teams. Um, I set out for myself and our team that I want EA to be the ultimate destination for game makers. If you want to have career defining experiences and you're a game maker, you have to be at EA. And so I needed to deeply understand what we were doing right and where we have gaps and opportunities to reach that aspirational goal that I have. And I learned a tremendous amount from the teams. I, I learned so much. And I think that the as, as we enter into this new era of our studio organization and in gaming in general, um, the idea that we show up in the world in um, a very human, authentic, connected way to our players is going to be one of the biggest priorities that we have. And um, and in turn, and, and through that, I need to show up and my leadership team needs to show up with our teams as well. And so I think that the idea about humanity and connection and compassion um, and how we treat each other, how we talk to each other and how we think about our players um, is going to become a far higher priority than it's ever been in our studio organization. And I'm just super excited about what that's going to mean because I think amazing things are going to come from that, um, from the creativity of our experiences to the social design of our experiences to life services. We are going to be on stage every single day, earning our players time every day every week, every month, every season. Okay. Um, and, and, and we are going to be quite engaged and our teams are going to be measured on engagement and player satisfaction and player sentiment. So we're really going to turn what success looks like in our studio organization. And I'm, I'm just so optimistic about where we're, where we're going to go. Well, we can't wait to see that. <laughs> So Andrew Wilson recently stated that the rate of change within gaming is accelerating, which we can all agree with, uh, with more disruption anticipated over the next five years than there has been in the last 45 years. Mm -hmm. So what are the biggest trends that you think might impact your approach to building and publishing games in the future? Yeah, it is a, an exciting time. There is no doubt. And we've seen changes in the past driven by technology changes. Mm -hmm. So console changes, hardware changes. Oh, this game looks more beautiful or it's, it's faster. Um, we are going to see technology drive our change, but it's going to be in a very different way than it's been in the past. And I think that with you know 5G coming in and cloud gaming and streaming, the idea that um, more games to more players um, for more timers is going to be more available than ever is going to change everything. And, um, and, I, and I believe that EA, how we're thinking about player networks and how we're thinking about player engagement and, um, and, and player retention and um, considering their daily, weekly, monthly, annual experiences is going to play a very large role in how we think about developing content. And it will change it going from developing a $60 game that you launch and that you put out once a year is going to be very different than a persistent service that we show up every day to earn our players time and, um, and, and engagement. And so it will change the way that we develop games, how we think about games and what motivates our development teams and how we connect with players. And I think in all the best of ways, and I actually think that gaming is going to evolve and become even more sophisticated and even better because of this. Well, we're very excited to see that. Thank you so much, Laura, for joining us and for your amazing insights. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me.